Welcome to Domain 5 Security Office. operations. And domain 5 makes up 18% of the exam questions. And here we really focus on all the stuff we do day to day. How do we in our daily work lives make sure we are well secure? We're going to look at configuration, patch and change management, cryptography, hashing, and some of the attacks against our encryption. We're going to look at data storage, data handling, data retention. Then we're going to look at administrative controls. We're going to be talking about training and awareness and social engineering. All right, let's get started on domain five. In this lecture, we're going to talk about configuration management. And configuration management is another of our preventative controls that we can put in place to make our environments more secure. Whenever we buy or build a new system, they are as default completely open. Every port is open, nothing is patched. Of course, if we get a system with secure defaults, then everything is locked down, nothing is open. But in most cases, we don't. So to make that system more secure, we would have that long list of things that we close, all the ports, all the accounts, all the services that we disable, delete, or lock. Then we apply all the patches. This is the server hardening we talked about already. And while we, in every place I have ever worked, we have had a server hardening document, from many other devices, we had nothing. In one place, they only did server hardening, nothing else. In other places, we might have had something for the networking devices, the wireless access points. And in those cases, the group that was responsible for those devices, the networking team, and they would then have some sort of loose list of all the things that needed to be shut off or turned off, but there wasn't anything formalized. They didn't have that rigid process. And if we don't have that rigid formal process, then we're going to catch maybe some of it, but we're not going to get everything. And by not doing that, by not having that complete rigid process we follow every time, we can open ourselves up to a bunch of security issues. Of course, it is better to do 50 of the 60 things on the list versus doing none of them, but that still leaves 10 vulnerabilities open. And in most places I have worked, we have had an operating system image that is completely hardened, and then we use that image to build new servers. Whenever there is a new vulnerability or there's a new patch, we build a new image. And an image is really just a copy of a system. And we then apply that to the new system instead of having to reinstall the operating system, harden the servers, apply all the patches. All that is already there. And like I said, in most places, we're pretty good about the servers. But what about the switches, the routers, the workstations, the phones, the wireless access points? And you have to think of this in terms of least privilege. We give the system whatever amount of least privilege they can do to actually function just like we did the systems that were designed with secure defaults. And much of this we have talked about already. So we built a new server. We put the operating system on there that has been hardened. We run our vulnerability scan against that server before we put it into production because we want to make sure that none of the known vulnerabilities are present on that system. But we also want to have a standardized baseline of our hardened operating systems. And we use that as much by default as possible because of course having it hardened makes it more secure, but also having the same baseline for all of them makes it much, much easier to troubleshoot all the systems when something is wrong. And of course here, we're gonna have some systems, some servers that need ports that are open that would as part of our regular hardening be closed. Well then for that specific server and for whatever application that needs that port open, we need to document this port has been opened. So again, here, when we're troubleshooting or we are rebuilding that system, we know port whatever needs to be open. One of the terms we can use for this is tailoring. We implement a certain security baseline, a standard, and then outside of that, that server might need these three ports open or the service should be running, but it isn't on all the other systems. But it doesn't stop there, right? Because the threat landscape is always changing. So we put the system into production and once it is in production, we start monitoring all the changes that are made away from that security baseline because we need to make sure that there are no administrators doing something that they're not supposed to and thereby weakening the security posture of that one server. I have worked in many places where administrators have gone in and changed things that they shouldn't just to make something work. And because they needed whatever to work right now, it's much easier to open up the things that makes the server less secure than it is to go through the right process and find the right fix. So obviously for the exam, the organization that you are in, 
we have the proper configuration management policies, and we have the proper monitoring of our servers and all of our other devices so we can see whenever any changes are made outside of the configuration baseline, and we can see is this approved or not. And any configuration change should have gone through the proper change control, which is one of our next lectures. If we haven't gone through that process, well, then the change should never be made. On top of that, many times when administrators just open ports to make something work, it is never documented. If we do the vulnerability scans on a regular basis, we may notice, but it's not certain. All right, let's recap. So whenever we build new systems, we buy new systems, most of them are going to be completely open. So we need to do that server hardening we talked about. We shut down all the ports that we don't need. We remove the default account. We apply all the patches. We disable any service that we don't need. Then we run a vulnerability scan against that system to make sure we got everything. And all the server hardening, all the device hardening should really happen automatically. We don't trust Bob to do all 100 things. It's more likely we get everything done if this is automated. Then once the system is inserted into our production environment, we start monitoring it. And we start monitoring for all the changes. If anyone makes changes outside of our security baseline, we get notified because only changes that have been approved in our change control should be made to the system and not just some admin that has a problem that needs to fix it quickly. And we keep monitoring the security baseline for any of our systems until we retire them. This is for the entire life cycle of that one system. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little bit of a better understanding of what we do in configuration management and why we do it. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about patch management. And we have patch management to make sure that all our devices on our network, that they are secure. And to do that, on a regular basis, we patch those systems. If you remember the Equifax breach, they lost, I think, 160 million Americans, credit scores, their social security numbers, and 50 other things. Two months before that breach, a patch was released fixing the problem, and that's kind of the trick, right? Once the patch is released, the attacker also knows the vulnerability is there. So as soon as the patch is out, we want to test it in our test environment, make sure it doesn't break anything else, and then we want to add the patch to our production environment. For two months, that patch was out. Now, Equifax may have done their due diligence. They may or may not have researched the patch, but they did not do their due care. If they had done their due care, they would have applied the patch. And that breach would never have happened. Again here, it's the same two things we keep getting back to. We do something we're not supposed to, or we don't do something that we should. If you think back to the last lecture when we talked about configuration management, admins opening ports they shouldn't, that's us doing something that we're not supposed to. With patch management, not applying the patches is us not doing something that we should. It really is that simple. And patching and patch management is a corrective control. Remember, corrective controls fix something that is broken or something that's vulnerable. Whenever a new vulnerability is discovered, it is expected by the software developer to release a new patch. And the fact that we expect it doesn't mean that it always happens. And for most of the larger applications, it does. And they do so on a regular basis. If you have ever worked in a Microsoft environment, you know that Patch Tuesday is the second Tuesday of every month. That day, every month, they release their new patches, fixing all the vulnerabilities that they have discovered and they have a patch for. Now, if they find a critical flaw, something that really needs to be fixed right now, well, then they release an out-of-cycle emergency patch. And the emergency patches are pushed out as soon as they are ready. For those, they don't wait for the monthly ones. And I think in any organization that I have worked in, after the patch comes out on Patch Tuesday, we wait maybe a week, maybe two. We test the patch in our test environment, and then we keep a very close eye on the forms, seeing if anyone else is experiencing problems caused by this patch. Just like I never recommend anyone to upgrade their operating systems to the latest version as soon as it is released, because there's just too many bugs and vulnerabilities. We don't want to do that in our environment. So with the patches, we wait a week. We wait two. We see what other people are experiencing. We see what happens when we patch our systems in our test environment. Because that specific patch might fix 99 things, but if it breaks one thing that is more critical for us and the security of our systems, well, then we don't apply the patches. And patch management is something that always needs to go through change management. And that really is true for any changes we make to our systems. All changes have to go through proper change management because first off, we have gone through and talked about what is this going to give us? What is it going to do if we don't? But also we have a record of that change. 
and you know through this course how I have been going on and on about that we need to patch everything, we need that solid defense in depth, and patching our systems is part of that. But it's important here again to remember that is all of our equipment. That is our networking equipment, the storage arrays, the VM hosts, all the IoT stuff we have, workstations, phones, servers. It really is anything that we have in our organization that if not patched, it could be a security threat. And while not patching our systems is a decision that I've seen being made in many places I have worked, most of the reasons for why they don't want to patch are not good reasons. So back to one of the data centers that I've worked in. We had a whole disk array, full rack, with maybe four or 500 disks in it, and that array had not been patched since it was installed 10 years prior. And the reason they hadn't patched that array was because the data storage was poorly designed. And then the longer they waited, the more the problem would compound. If we updated that storage rack, it might break because there were so many patches that needed to be applied. And even if it didn't break, it would be offline for several hours because there were so many patches. On top of that, we didn't have enough storage to move the data somewhere else while we were doing the update. Because again here, poor design, we didn't have additional storage to move the data to. And because of that, it just sat there for 10 years, not patched. And at some point I asked, well, what happens if it breaks? And the answer was, well, that just can't happen. And that's just not how IT works. So for most of the years I worked at that place, first off, we had a full storage rack that was unencrypted, secondly, not patched. And this was at a hospital. And there was just no desire both from IT and from leadership to fix it. Luckily for us, at some point, outside auditors came in and realized all that patient data was sitting there unencrypted. And magically, now we found the money and we can fix the system. Isn't it amazing how things work? And with patches, just like most things in IT and IT security, the more we can take people out of the equation, the better. We can to a large extent do that through automations, because this is the same as the server hardening. We do that automatically, so they don't implement 99 things and forget one. With patch management, we don't rely on people to push the software out to all the stations that need that update. First off, what if they miss some of them? Secondly, it's a ton of work. So what we really want to do is use some sort of tool, SCCM or WSIS, that can help us push the software out to our organization. And those softwares help us push software out to any system and patches are a part of that. Now we would do those pushes outside of business hours, in most cases on Friday night or Saturday night. And it's normally something we do slightly after midnight because a lot of backups are set to start at midnight and it takes them between half an hour and an hour and a half to finish. So a good time to start the software pushes might be at two or three in the morning. And then normally we wouldn't want to go too much past five in the morning because if we're not done by then and we have to do some troubleshooting, that's not gonna leave us very much time before people start coming in at seven or eight in the morning. So when we apply our patches, we need to make sure we wait an appropriate amount of time, make sure nothing breaks, we test it, we have users test it, but we don't have the luxury of waiting too long. This again here goes back to as soon as the patch is released, the attacker knows the vulnerability is there. One week, two weeks might be okay, but we don't wait two months plus like Equifax did. Now let's say on a patch Tuesday, Microsoft pushes out 35 new updates for this patch. If there are no major security flaws, nothing we really need to worry about, then we can go through and pick the ones that would apply in our environment. We deploy those to our test environment, and the important keyword here is test. We don't just apply them in production. We go in, we wait, we see if everything works. We have the users test, do all the functionality in their applications work. Assuming nothing is broken, then we go through the proper change control, and then at that change control meeting, we tell them this is what we're changing, this is what that change is going to give us. This is what's going to happen if we don't make that change. Here is the impact of it. And here is our rollback plan. Because assuming something goes wrong when we deploy the patch, we need to have a plan on how we can revert. And this is where we would use that copy backup we talked about because we don't want to interrupt the backup cycle. And then if and when the change control board approves the patch, well then we apply the patch in that service window that we have been given by the change control board. All right, let's recap. We talked about patch management. Whenever most vendors discover software vulnerabilities in their software, they try to fix that and they do that by releasing patches. Whenever a patch is released, we should implement it to our systems within a reasonable amount of time. Now what that is depends on what we're patching. In most places, I would say within a couple of weeks. We shouldn't do what Equifax did, where they waited more than two months. 
Had they passed their systems, in those two months, they would never have been breached. On Microsoft Systems, it's Patch Tuesday, the second Tuesday of every month, there's going to be new patches. We deploy those patches to our test environment. We see if it breaks anything. We have our users test all the applications and the regular functionality and see if anything has been impacted by applying this patch. For something as big as Microsoft, they also have emergency patches. And that's for anything that's critical enough that it can't wait until Patch Tuesday. Here, they do auto cycle patches. And it really is important that we patch everything. We don't just only patch the servers. We patch our storage array, our networking equipment, our VM hosts, anything we have that's IoT, workstations, phones, really anything that we can patch needs to be patched if there's a new patch out for it. And like with most other things, we want to automate as much as possible so we don't have that human error. So for our patches, or really for any software push, we use something like SCCM or WSIS. That way, the patches are going to get pushed out to every single system. We don't miss some because whomever is pushing the patches out is tired or just forgets about a segment. We would normally do patches starting at maybe 2 or 3 in the morning. That way, the systems have had enough time to finish the backup. And then we probably shouldn't go much past 5 in the morning. Because if we have to do some troubleshooting, we don't really have a lot of time before staff starts coming in at 7 or 8 in the morning. We can also, if we look at the Microsoft patches, but really this is true for anything. We can look at all the things to fix in this patch and then pick the ones that are appropriate for us. If there's nothing critical, well, maybe we only do some of the patches, some of the updates, because we might not have whatever the rest are for in our environment. If we don't have that system or that type of configuration, there's no point in applying that patch. And then with any change in our environment, patches included, we go through proper change control. And we do that after we have tested the patch. We go in and tell them when we apply this patch, this is what we're changing. This is what we're going to get out of it. This is what's going to happen if we don't make that change. Here's the impact of the patch. And here is our rollback plan. And then when and if the change control board approves the patch, well, then we applied in the specific window for that patch that we have been given by the change control board. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little bit better understanding of patches and why it's so critical that we apply them within a reasonable amount of time and what happens if we don't. Thank you for being here and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about change management. And change management is our formalized process where we handle all the changes in our environment. We have briefly touched on this before in configuration and in patch management. We don't just go in and make changes to the configuration on our devices without going through proper change management. So we have that formalized change management process where whenever we want to make a change, we go in and we justify the why, where, when, how for all the changes that we want to make. And changes can really be a ton of different things. That can be adding the patches or upgrading the operating system. It could be adding a new server, making changes to configurations on our firewalls, or just using a new image for our servers or our workstations. It is really anything where we're going to make changes to our environment. And to approve or reject those changes, we have a change review board. And that board is made up both of IT and then the operational units that that specific change is going to affect. And in many places I have worked, we also have subboards, meaning the change review board is the overarching board, but then we would have change approval boards, technical approval boards, and many others. Let's say, for instance, we're updating a server that is a pharmacy server. Well, then we would have someone from the pharmacy team on one of those boards. If this is an upgrade that's requested by the pharmacy team, they would answer these questions. If this is something that we need to do, then we need to tell them this is what we're doing. This is how this is going to impact your group. Do you see any issues with that? And here we most likely need to be that translating link that can translate the IT talk into real people talk. If we continue with the example of that pharmacy server, we have found a vulnerability in the software and we want to patch that vulnerability. Then we need to do the research. Is this going to break anything else? And just like we need to do with our regular patches, why are we doing this? We need to be able to clearly articulate this is the good reason for applying this patch. This is all the good stuff that's going to happen if we do it. And this is all the bad stuff that potentially could happen if we don't. And the change process here is very similar to a regular patch. But it could just as well have been an IP change or added equipment or whatever else we're doing in our environment. On the change review boards and on any of the subboards, 
It is possible to have someone from senior management be on that board, but in most places I've seen they're just too busy. So instead we have some sort of range of things that that board can approve, and it's just like regular operations. Within certain parameters, as long as the entire board approves, go ahead and make the changes. But if for some reason there's something out of the ordinary, something that we don't normally see, or making this change doesn't fit within the purview and the guidelines that we have, then we might have to involve senior management. Or if it's on impact, if something goes wrong, this is grave, this could impact our entire system, well then they might need to be involved as well. For our change management process, there are a ton of different frameworks and models that we can use. Which one we choose really depends on the needs of our organization, which makes sense for us. What kind of infrastructure do we have? What line of business are we in? And 50 other things. For the exam, you don't need to know the specific ones, but I would understand the general flow and understand why the steps are in the order that they are. So at a high level, the flow would look something like this. We identify the change, then we propose the change, we go in and we assess the risks, the impacts and the benefits, both of implementing and not implementing. This is what we're going to get if we implement. This is what possibly could happen if we don't. Then we get a provisional approval that allows us to test and see if what we are expecting to see is what's actually happening when we make the change. If the change looks like what we're expecting, then we move on. If not, well then we'll go back to either proposing the change or assessing the risk. Let's assume for this example everything looks right. We're seeing the results we expect. Well then we go ahead and schedule the actual change. Because up until now, we have only done things in our test environment. Then we send a change notification out to everybody who's going to be affected by this change and the presumable downtime. And this can sometimes be somewhat of a challenge in a large organization because we need to identify everybody who's actually affected by the change. Then we implement the change, assuming everything goes well. We do the post-implementation reporting. We make sure that everything that we're expecting to see is what's actually happening. And sometimes we need to be a little bit careful here. In most places I have worked in, and I'm assuming it's true for most environments, the test environment and the production environment are not identical, which means in some cases we're not going to get the same results. And the post-implementation reporting would be very similar to what we do in lessons learned. Did everything work the way we assumed it would? If not, what can we do to make that better next time? And then after we have implemented, we very closely monitor and audit the changes to make sure nothing changes over time. And then also we need to be clear on us changing something in our environment could open up to other risks, residual risks, which then we might possibly need to mitigate. And here, as with everything else we do as IT and cybersecurity professionals, we need to have that proper documentation and records for everything that we do. Not only to show what we did in case we get audited, but also if someone needs to go back and look at the work you did and there's nothing. I have worked in so many places where there is no documentation on anything that was done. In many of those places, the people who made the change don't work there anymore, so we don't know what they did, we don't know why they did it, or how they did it. If we are lucky, we can at best reverse engineer it. And then at worst, we can touch those systems, because if we did that, that would break too many things. And then here I also think we need to talk a little bit about two different terms, change management and change control. Change management is everything. That is the entire process. And if you are familiar with project management, that would be the entire project. Initiation, planning, executing and monitoring and closing. Whereas change control, on the other hand, are the parts where we control the change. Makes sense, right? We've done all the pre-assessments. We've done all the planning. Now we need to make sure that everything happens according to plan. We control the change. And here I think it also makes sense to look at PCDA. Plan, do, check, act. And you will in many places see PDCA as a circle because it is an iterative process. Whenever we are done with ACT, we go back to plan. And we can use PDCA for many things, not just change management. And if you look at other change management frameworks, you see the flow is the same. We request the change, we analyze it, we get approval, we plan the implementation, we communicate, we implement and test. If we're successful, we communicate that. If we're not successful, we do a rollback and then we communicate that. And then as the final piece, the change is accepted. We do our lessons learned. And since I think the flow and the logic behind it is important, go through it, logic through it, see if it makes sense to you. If it doesn't, revisit the lecture until you can see the natural flow in this. Until you're at a point where you can think, okay, we do this, then we do that, then we do this. If this doesn't work, we do that. Just logic your way through the process. All right, let's recap. 
In this lecture, we talked about change management. And change management is our formalized process. We handle any change to our environment. That can be configuration changes, patch management. It doesn't really matter. It's a change in our environment. And we need to go through that process for everything that we change. For our changes, we have a change review board. And that's made up both by IT, because we understand what that change is going to do, but also the operational units that this change is going to affect as well. On top of that, we also have subboards, technical approval boards, change approval boards, or whatever we need. We clearly communicate to the users that are using these systems, why are we making this change? What is it going to get us? What is it going to get us if we don't? And that's really the same thing we use for the change control board. This is why we're doing this patch. This is all the good stuff we're going to get if we do. This is all the bad stuff that potentially could happen if we don't. This is how we're going to back out if for some reason it doesn't work. And then on our change control board, we don't normally have senior management on those boards, but we probably have a certain set of parameters. Anything within those we can approve without senior management. But if it's something where the impact can be really grave, here we might need their approval. There are a ton of different frameworks that we can use for change management. Which one we choose really depends on the needs of our organization. What do we need? What kind of infrastructure do we have? What kind of business are we in? And many other things. The flow in most of them are going to be the same. Some of them are just specialized in this type of environment or this line of business. And then assuming we implement the change, we're successful, then we monitor the change, and then we report on what went well and what did not. And we do that again, not to lay blame, but to be more successful and have a better implementation next time. As part of us testing the change, we need to be aware that in most places, test and production environments are not identical. So when we deploy the change, the results might also be different. And when we have implemented, us implementing whatever change can have open new risks that will be residual risks that we then may need to mitigate. And then, of course, we need to have proper documentation and records for everything that we do both so we can go back and audit, also so whomever is working on this next time, they can go in and very clearly see what you did and why you did it. And then, of course, know the difference between change management and change control. Change management is everything. Change control is controlling the change. Makes sense, right? And then finally, we talked about PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. And really here, it's the same flow as in any of the other frameworks. We request the change, we analyze it, we get approval, we plan the implementation, we communicate, we implement and test. If we are successful, we communicate that. If we're not, we do a rollback and communicate that. And then finally, we have acceptance. Once the change is accepted, we do our lessons learned. And with that, we are done with this lecture. Thank you for being here. I hope this has given you a better understanding of change management and how it is such an integral part of any change we make in our environment. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture.
In this and the following lectures, we're going to talk about cryptography. And cryptography is the science of securing communication. And to start off right, we're going to talk about the history of cryptography. And you might think, wait, what? How is that possibly relevant? And it is relevant for two reasons. First off, learning how something evolved, how it was used over time, can make you understand why we do some of the things we do today. Secondly, and much more important, it's on the exam. So since this is something you might see on the exam and it's easy to learn, it really just is stuff you need to memorize, meaning these are easy win points. Take them where you can get them. So to start out, we have the Spartan Cytel. And that really just is a long piece of cloth. And we wrap that cloth around a stick of a certain diameter. Then we write the message across that cloth while it's on the stick. Once you're done, you remove it from the stick and you send it to the receiver. Now, if someone intercepts that message, they're just going to see a long piece of cloth or parchment with letters that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Even if for some reason they decide to wrap it around a stick, if that stick is not exactly the same diameter, it's not going to line up. They can't read the text. And here really, two sticks of the same diameter is what we used for our shared secret here. This is symmetric encryption. With symmetric encryption, both parties have the same key. They use that to encrypt and decrypt with. Next up, we have the seizure cipher, and that is a substitution cipher. Here, we have our message in plain text, and then we just move those letters a couple of rows in the alphabet. The example you see here on the right, the characters have moved three letters to the left. So if our plain text message is past the exam, if we move that three letters, it would be MXPP, QEB, BUXDA. It is super simple, but again, at the time, it was effective. And really here, we use cryptography to keep our secret secret. It's a big part of the confidentiality leg of the CIA triad, and that is what most people think cryptography is, nothing else. But it can also help us make sure that our data is unaltered, meaning it provides integrity, it can be used for authentication of a subject, and we can use it to provide non-repudiation. Cryptography has been used for thousands of years to keep our secret secret. And I think for the exam, you need to understand how the different types of encryption work, the advantages and disadvantages of the different types, and how, where, and why we would deploy it. It is as with anything else we do, we want exactly enough encryption, not too much, not too little. We want our encryption to be so strong that it is unbreakable, or at least it's going to take an unreasonable amount of time to break it. Now, how much time that is depends on what we're protecting. If we say it's going to take an attacker 10 years to decrypt our message, well, maybe then we're okay. But again here, it depends on what we are protecting. We need to have that good balance between confidentiality and availability. The stronger encryption we use, the longer it's going to take us to encrypt it and someone else to decrypt it. Now, let's take a look at some definitions. And let me be very clear here. You need to know and understand these definitions, not necessarily because there's going to be what is cryptanalysis or something like that on the exam. But you may get a question where it says we're using cryptography or cryptology or cryptanalysis. And then it lists a scenario. And from that scenario, you need to know what to do next or what is best. And your answer needs to be the right one depending on if we're securing communication or we're creating messages with hidden meanings or we are breaking encrypted communication. So cryptology is the science of securing communication. Cryptography is where we create the messages where the meaning is hidden. And then cryptanalysis is the science of breaking those encrypted communications. And with most of the cryptographic algorithms that we use today, they are often very hard, if not impossible to break, which obviously is wonderful. But then the attackers are very smart people, so they go look for that weak link somewhere else. They don't have to break our cryptographic algorithm if they can just go hack one of our servers where we store the cryptographic keys. In crypt analysis, we can also use mathematical analysis to try to attack the actual algorithm. But we also use side channel attacks. For them, they don't care how they break it as long as they can access to whatever they want. And if we go back to the house analogy again here, it doesn't matter that we have that amazing security system, we have great locks on the doors if we leave a window open. The attacker is going to find that weakest link, even if they can't break the algorithm. We have been smart enough not to keep the keys on a server they can get into. What if we miss something in the implementation? That can be both the cryptography itself, or it can be the devices we run it on. And then the final definition we have on this page is a cipher. That is the cryptographic algorithm that we use to either encrypt or decrypt. It's a series of well-defined steps that we use to encrypt the plain text or the clear text into the ciphertext. Or the other way around, 
from the ciphertext into plain text, which sort of covers the first two bullet points here. The plain text is the text that you and I can read. That is the unencrypted message. That is what we're trying to keep secret. Once we have encrypted, well, then it is ciphertext. The encryption converts our plain text into ciphertext. And then the decryption converts that ciphertext back into plain text. Some of the other legacy types of encryption that you may need to use could be a book cipher. I think we've all seen the movie where the hero or the villain gets a piece of paper with some random numbers on it. They then go look on the bookshelf, find a specific book, and then use that book to decipher the message. That is a book cipher. It is symmetric encryption, and the reason why we call it symmetric encryption is because the encryption key and the decryption key are the same. Whoever wrote the message had the same book, the same version as the hero or the villain does, so they used the book to encrypt the message, and then on the other end, they used the book to decrypt. Then they would just send numbers as the secret message. It would say 244.2.13,12.3.7, and so on. Whoever tries to decrypt it, go over to the bookshelf, grabs the book, go to page 244, second sentence, and the 13th word in that sentence. That is the first part of our message. Then you go to page 12, sentence 3, word number 7. And we do that for all the numbers until we have decoded the entire message. And I would assume this is no longer used, but who knows. Then we have a running key cipher. And here again, this is symmetric encryption. The sender and the receiver can agree on a certain phrase, and they then use that phrase to encrypt and decrypt the message. Let's say that they use the IC squared code of ethics preamble, the safety and welfare of society, and the common good. Now, if I want to send you a message with that, I would take my plain text, add the preamble to the plain text, and this is similar to modular math. Once I'm done with the preamble, I start over. That effectively scrambles all the letters. I send the encrypted message to the receiver. They subtract the preamble from my message. They get the plain text message. It really just is super simple addition and subtraction. It's really not used, but I understand how it works. So on the first letter, whatever letter I have, I have that and then a plus T because that is the first letter of the preamble, the safety. Really here, you can just view the letters as numbers. My letter or number plus whatever is the first letter or number of the preamble. The second letter of the preamble is H because it's the safety. The third one is E and so on. The receiver just does it all in reverse. And with that, we are done with this lecture. Thank you for being here and I will see you in the next one. Now, let's talk a little bit about asymmetric encryption. We have for thousands of years used symmetric encryption, where both the sender and receiver have the same key, but asymmetric encryption is a very young technology, at least compared to symmetric. We have used asymmetric encryption for practical purposes for maybe 40, 50 years. Compared to the thousands of years that we have used symmetric encryption, it's not that long. So in the 1970s, multiple different types of asymmetric encryption was developed, that includes Diffie-Hellman from 1976, RSA, which was named after its developers, just like Diffie-Hellman, Rivest, Schirmer, and Edelman. And RSA was published in 1977. Another key difference here between symmetric and And asymmetric encryption is that for each person or each entity we have with asymmetric encryption, we need two keys. If we have 500 users, we need a thousand keys. If we have a million users, we need two million keys. So the math here is pretty simple. Whereas with symmetric encryption, for each pair that needs to communicate, you need one key. But if that is the same 500 people that needed the thousand asymmetric keys, with symmetric keys, they would need 124,750 keys because each of those 500 people will need 499 keys to communicate with everybody. With asymmetric encryption, we encrypt with one key and we decrypt with the other. Let's say that I'm going to send you a message, and I want it to be only read by you. Well, then I get your public key. That is a key that is available to everybody. Everybody can see that key, and the keys work in a pair. You need both for it to function, and they are asymmetric, meaning they're not the same. So I encrypt the message with your public key. The only way to decrypt that message is using your private key. You keep that secret. Now, if anyone else were to intercept that message that was encrypted with your public key, they can't do anything with that because they don't have your private key 
they can decrypt the message. And that really is the reason why asymmetric encryption is so nice. We can send messages over an unsecure medium like the internet without having that pre-shared key that we would with symmetric encryption. Because that really has been the problem with symmetric encryption, how do we agree on whatever we're using as the secret key, that shared secret? How do we agree on what size of stick we use? How do we agree on how many letters we switch it back for the Caesar cipher? How do we agree on which book we use for the book cipher, in which version? We need a way to share that information. With asymmetric, we don't have that problem. But this is also why it is so important that you keep your private key secure. If that gets compromised, if an attacker gains access to the key, well, then they can read all your messages. Now, let's say that I sent that message to you. You read it. Now, you want to respond. Well, then you use my public key, just like I used yours with the message I sent to you. You use my public key to encrypt the reply. I use my private key to decrypt it. Since I only have my private key, no one else does, I'm the only one that can read the reply. Does that make sense? And if not, just logic through it a couple of times. We can also use asymmetric encryption for digital signatures. And here the order is slightly in reverse. When we use asymmetric encryption, the point is to keep our secret secret. It's focused on the confidentiality leg of the CIA triad. But when we use digital signatures, well then we want authenticity and we want non-repudiation. We want to be able to prove that that email came from whoever sent it or whomever signed that document. We may or may not need the confidentiality at all. And since the point here is the authenticity and the non-repudiation, in that case, if I send you a message, I encrypt it with my private key. Since I am the only one who has my private key, well then you know that message came from me, because you can decrypt it with my public key. That of course in no way provides confidentiality. That's not the point of it. We want authenticity and we want non-repudiation. But let's pretend we want both. If we want the authenticity, we want the non-repudiation, but we also want the confidentiality. If you want, you can pause the lecture here for a minute and think, how would we do that? If you don't, well, then don't. So assuming you stop the lecture, welcome back. If not, well then, hello again. So with my message, I want non-repudiation, I want authenticity, and I also want confidentiality. How do we do that? And the answer here again is private and public keys. We really do it both ways around. I want to be able to prove that message came from me, so I use my private key. But I also want only you to decrypt that message. Well, then I use your public key. So I encrypt it with my private key. Then I encrypt that ciphertext with your public key, so it gets encrypted twice. Then when you get it, you decrypt it with your private key. Since you are the only one who has that, you are the only one who can read the message. And then you decrypt again using my public key. That way, we ensure that only you can read it and we can prove it came from me. If it doesn't make sense, logic your way through it a couple of times, understand the flow, and think about how we use public and private keys. I use my private key to encrypt. That can be decrypted by anyone because my public key is in the public domain. But I also use your public key on top of my private key. That means only you can decrypt it. Does that make sense? Now, for the actual data we send over the internet, we really use hybrid encryption because both symmetric and asymmetric have things they're really good at. Asymmetric is good about sharing the keys over the unsecured medium, the internet. Symmetric encryption is awesome about sending data fast, but we need to be able to share that key, the symmetric key, before we can start the fast data transfer. Asymmetric encryption can help us do that. So we use asymmetric encryption first, that establishes the session and shares the key. Then for the actual data transfer, we use symmetric encryption. And then in many places, we would also have a re-authentication ever so often using asymmetric and maybe a new key. And with that, we are done with this lecture. Thank you for being here and I will see you in the next one. All right, let's recap. In this lecture, we talked about cryptography. We started out with a history of cryptography, and yes, this can be testable. We had the Spartan Sightail. That was the one where we wrapped a piece of cloth around a stick. That stick was our secret key. We then wrote a message across the cloth, removed the stick, sent the cloth to the receiver, and they would then use a stick of exactly the same diameter to read the text. Even if that cloth was intercepted, unless they used a stick with exactly the same diameter, they couldn't read the text. Then we had the Caesar cipher. That was the substitution cipher. We just moved the letters a certain amount to the left or to the right in the alphabet. 
Then we talked a little bit about how most people think that cryptography is only about keeping our secrets secret, but it can also give us integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. And of course here, we use strong enough encryption that it shouldn't be breakable within a reasonable amount of time. Now, how long that is and how strong that is depends on what we are protecting. Then we talked about some definitions. Cryptology, that is the science of securing communication. Cryptography, that is us creating messages where the meaning is hidden, they are encrypted. Cryptanalysis is the science of breaking that secured communication. And then the cipher is the actual cryptographic algorithm. We also had the plain text or the clear text. That is the unencrypted message. That's the one that you and I can read. The ciphertext is the encrypted message. That's the one we send that the receiver then decrypts. Encryption is converting the plain text into the ciphertext. Decryption is converting the ciphertext back into plain text. Then we talked about a book cipher. That's the one where we have the same book in the same version. And then you go to page 244, line 12, word 3, and so on. We've all seen that in the movies, right? Then we have a run key cipher. If I have a whole letter I'm going to write to you, and let's say that phrase that we agree upon is 15 letters. Once those 50 letters are used up, they just start over. And it's basically just addition. I take the number value of my letter and I add it to that letter of that phrase, scrambling the letters. You then do the same in reverse. We talked about how we have used symmetric encryption for thousands of years. And with symmetric encryption, we need a key pair for everybody who needs to talk. If it is only two people, well, then we need one key. We share that key. If it is 10 people, we need 45 keys. If it is 500 people, then we need 124,750. So the larger amount of people that need to talk with a symmetric key, it's going to be an insane amount of keys. 10,000 people, almost 50 million keys. Whereas with symmetric encryption, each person or each entity just needs two keys, the private key and the public key. The public key is shared with the public. Everybody can get it. The private key is kept as secure as possible. Now, how we use the public key and the private key depends on what we're trying to achieve. If it's confidentiality, well then, when I send you a message, I encrypt it with your public key. Because you are the only one who has the private key. You are the only one who can decrypt. If you want to reply to me, you encrypt the message, the reply, with my public key. Since I am the only one who has my private key, I am the only one who can read that message. But we can also use this for digital signatures. And here the purpose is entirely different. We want authenticity and we want non-repudiation. We want to make sure that the message is authentic and we want to make sure that the sender is who they say they are. So here we do it in reverse. When I send data to you, I encrypt it with my private key. That can be decrypted with my public key that everybody has. But it has to have originated from me because I am the only one who has my private key. I am the only one who can encrypt with that. But again here, the point is not confidentiality. It is authenticity and it is non-repudiation. But we can, if we want, get both. In that scenario, again here, I encrypt it with my private key so we know the data came from me. But if I only want you to read that message, I encrypt the ciphertext that I already encrypted with my private key. I encrypt that again with your public key, meaning only you can decrypt that. That way, we get the authenticity, we get non-repudiation, but we also get confidentiality. And with most of what we do on the internet, we use hybrid encryption. We use both symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption is much, much faster. Asymmetric encryption is much slower, but we can send that shared key that we need for the symmetric encryption over an unsecured medium, the internet. And we can't do that with symmetric. So we use asymmetric, the one with the private and public key, to get the shared secret from me to you. That is the key for the symmetric encryption. And then once that is exchanged, we switch to the symmetric encryption because we both have the key now. We send the data much faster, and depending on how long the session is, every so often, we might send a new session key over asymmetric just to make sure that our session is still secure. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped to get a little bit of a better understanding of encryption and cryptography why we use it, how we use it, where we use it. And I understand that when you start out, this can be a difficult topic because there's just so much new stuff, there's so much complexity. If you need, of course, rewatch the videos, go research elsewhere too if you need that. Because understanding that flow, I think, is important. Why we do it, how we do it, when we do it, and what we can do when we mix the different types. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about hashing. 
and hashing is also cryptography. With hashing, it is a one-way function, meaning it is not reversible, and we use it only for integrity. It doesn't give us confidentiality, it doesn't give us non-repudiation, or anything like that. This is only for integrity. We use it to ensure that a file or system is unaltered. And with the hash functions that they're not reversible, that is how they're supposed to work. We don't need to decrypt anything. We just need to make sure that no file was changed. And as you can see here in bold, it is a variable length plain text fixed length hash value or MD message digest. And that is part of the key here. Variable length plain text means that it doesn't matter how long the plain text is. It can be 10 letters or it can be 20,000. When it's turned into a hash, that hash is a fixed length. So the size of the input doesn't matter the size of the output could be 30 characters or whatever we have chosen it to be and as you know when things are in bold those are keywords so variable length plain text fixed length value hash or md now we can use this for a variety of things but really it is just to show that the data is unaltered it still has its integrity this can be when you download a file from the internet on many sites where you download patches or software there will also be a corresponding hash that is the hash that this software is supposed to have. You download the file, you hash that file, and if your hash matches what they publicized, then you can assume that file is unaltered. And I say assume because there's no guarantee. Because technically a hacker could have hacked the original site, changed the original file, and then changed the hash so it matches the malware, but in the vast majority of cases, that is not a concern. Another thing you need to know about for hashes are collisions. And a collision is when the hashing of two different sets of data, two different sets of plain text, provide the same hash. It's very uncommon, at least unless there's a flaw in the hashing algorithm, but it is still possible. So here is an example of how hashing works. Here I have taken Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, the entire first chapter. That is about 1800 words. Then I went to a hash generator online, I generated a hash for that entire chapter, and that gave me the first hash right here. The one you can see here, 2B, 72, B2C, and so on. So if someone sends me that file and they send me that hash, if I hash the file and it matches, I know nothing was changed. Then I went in and I removed one comma in that 1800 words chapter. And now you can see the hash is entirely different. This one is 21B7AD and so on. Completely different hash just by removing one comma. On the third round, instead of just removing that comma, I changed that comma into a period. Again, minor change that almost no one would notice. I did another hash. Now it is 5058 F1 and so on. So with hashing, we use it to confirm that a file or data was not changed. If we are attacked and someone compromises a hard drive and we want to use that hard drive in a court of law, well then we do a hash of the full hard drive then we take an exact copy of that hard drive, we do another hash on the copy drive, and those two hashes should match. If they do, the data on the drives are identical. Then we do our digital forensics on the copy drive. Once we are done, we do another hash, because we want to make sure we didn't change anything on the copy drive. And all three hashes have to match. The original drive, the copy, and the one we have after we're done with our forensics. I think for the exam, you probably don't need to know the names of the different hashing algorithms, but just in case, at least know MD5 and then SHA2 and 3. All right, let's recap. We talked about hash functions, and they are one-way functions, meaning they only work one way. You can't take the hash and then get the original plain text. And we only use it for integrity. The keywords here were, it's a variable length plain text that is hashed into a fixed length hash. So it doesn't matter if it's 20 letters or 20,000 letters, the output, the hash, is whatever length we choose. With hashes, we can have collisions, and that is when two different plain texts produces the same hash. It is very, very unlikely unless there's a flaw in the algorithm, but it is possible. And then we had the example with the first chapter of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. I did a hash on the original text, then I deleted a comma, the hash changed completely, then instead of deleting the comma, I put a period, and again here, the hash changed completely. With the hash, we have no clue what changed, we just know something was changed. And we can use that when we download software online. If we want to make sure this is the original software, we can compare whatever we downloaded to the original. We can also use it in our digital forensics. If a system was compromised, we do a hash of the compromised drive, then we do a big level copy of that drive. We do a hash on the copy. If they match, well then they are identical. Then we do our forensics on the copy drive, and then when we're done, 
we do another hash to make sure we didn't change anything. And then I don't think you need to know the hashing algorithms, but maybe just recognize them, MD5 or SHA-2 or 3. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little bit of a better understanding of hashing and where and why we use it. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about attacks on our cryptography. And some of these we have touched on briefly before, but I figure it makes sense here to have dedicated videos that focus on cryptographic attacks. First off, we have steal the key. It's much, much more efficient and faster to just steal the key than it is to break the actual encryption. The encryption that we use today is to some extent so strong it's not feasible to break it unless we use some sort of side channel attacks or we steal the key. And if an attacker can gain access to the systems where we store our encryption keys, well then they can steal it. If this is law enforcement, well then they kind of need to do the same thing. They get a search warrant, they then search your computer, they find your private key or the private key of the organization, and then use that to decrypt your data. Regardless of how it happens, they now have our key. They can decrypt all of our messages. And this again goes back to it doesn't matter that we have that wonderful security posture throughout everything if we have one weak link. And especially if that weak link is our key repository. So steal the key is exactly what it sounds like. It's someone stealing our encryption key. Next up, we have brute force. We have talked about this one before. We can technically break any encryption as long as we have enough time and assuming we don't get locked out of the system if we keep trying. There is nothing sophisticated about a brute force attack. It is exactly what it sounds like. It uses the entire key space, every single combination, and given enough time, any ciphertext can be decrypted. Let's say we use it on a password. Well, then we start with A. Is that the password? Well, then no. Then we go to B. Is it B? No. Then C. Then D. And so on. And it does that until it goes through the entire key space, meaning all letters, all numbers, all possible characters on a keyboard. Once it's gone through all of those, then it starts with AA, AB, AC, and so on. So the keyword here is it uses the entire key space and it tries every single combination. But this, of course, then also takes a ton of time. That can be hundreds or thousands of years. And here, one of the things we can do is implement countermeasures that can be pretty simple. If we continue with the example of the password, well, then we just add something saying after five wrong password attempts, we lock the account. Then maybe after an hour, you get five tries more. If you fail again, well, then now it's 12 hours or you need an admin to unlock the account. Another thing we can use to prevent things like brute force attacks could be key stretching. And no, we're not really stretching any keys. We're adding a small timer. So whenever someone types in their password, we add a small amount of time before they get a yes, this was the right password or no, this was the wrong password. Let's say we just add one second every time we verify a password. Well, then if an attacker needs millions and millions and millions of attempts to guess our password using brute force, this is no longer a feasible attack vector. They will then, of course, try something else. And that really is the key through everything that we do. We need to make sure that that component is secure enough. There is nothing that is completely secure. It is those complementary overlapping security measures, the exact right amount of security. And there is no point in spending thousands of dollars to protect $100. Next up, we have a man in the middle attack or MITM, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It is someone in the middle of a legit conversation where neither party that is having the conversation knows someone is in between them. This could be Bob and John thinking they're having a private conversation, but Mike has inserted himself in the middle of that conversation and he's relaying messages in both directions. Doing that, Mike can either change the information, he can steal it, or he can add completely new information into the conversation. So if you look at the graphics over here on the right, a conversation could be something like this. Bob initiates by writing John, Hey John, this is Bob, send me your key. Mike, who is in the middle, forwards the request to John, John sends his public key to Mike, Mike keeps that public key, and he replaces it with his own public key. He sends it to Bob, and now Bob thinks he has John's public key. He encrypts his message with that, he sends it to Mike, but in actuality, he encrypted his message with Mike's public key. Mike then decrypts with his private key, he reads the message, maybe he changes it, he then encrypts his message with John's public key, and sends that to John. At that point, 
Bob and John still think they're talking to each other, and that really is how the man in the middle attack works. An attacker puts themselves in the middle of a conversation, and then they can read or alter all the messages between the two parties. What if Bob was sending John a million dollars? Well, then John would send the account number, but since Mike intercepts it, he's gonna change that account number, change it to his own, and Mike is now a million dollars richer. I know, silly example, but you get the idea, right? And we have a couple of times talked about a side channel attack. And a side channel attack is just us learning information about a system based on power consumption or timing or some other factor that in itself doesn't tell us anything. But let's say we poorly designed our system for passwords. And if you put in a username and a password and both are wrong, it takes three seconds to get that message. But if the username was right and the password is wrong, maybe it takes six seconds. Well, then you know, as soon as you have the right user ID, it's going to take six seconds. We now know this is a valid user ID. Or it could be they gain access to a system that can't do anything on the system, but they can see how much power does that system consume when we do encryption and decryption. Then based on that power consumption, they might realize it is this type of encryption with this strong of a key, because that's how much power that will take. So really, it is just us discovering something about the system or the encryption type that we really shouldn't be able to, but because it's implemented wrong or the systems are not protected enough, the attacker can get that information. All right, let's recap. In this lecture, we talked about cryptographic attacks. We started out with steal the key. It is much easier to steal the key than it is to break the actual encryption. Now, how they steal that really depends on our implementation. If we have a weak server where we store all of our private keys, if the attacker can gain access to that, they now have access to everything. Then we talked about brute force attacks. Those are the ones that uses the entire key space and every single form of encryption can be broken using brute force. But in most cases, it doesn't really matter because it can take hundreds or thousands of years. To mitigate some of that, we can implement something where if you type your password wrong five times, well then your account is locked. Or we can add key stretching. Every time we verify a password, it takes one or two seconds. Since a brute force attack needs millions and millions of attempts, it's no longer a feasible attack vector. Then we talked about man in the middle attacks. Those are the one where two parties think they're having a private conversation, but someone has inserted themselves in the middle and they're relaying all the information. They can either send their original information back and forth, or they can change it for whatever they want. That's the one where Bob is trying to send a million dollars to John, but Mike, who's in the middle of that conversation, switches out the account number, he now gets that million dollars. And then finally, we talked about side channel attacks. That's where we learn something that we shouldn't be able to from some sort of misconfiguration or access they shouldn't have. That was the one where if both the username and password is wrong, it takes three seconds. But if the username is right and it actually goes in to see is this the right password, well, then it takes six seconds. We now know this is a valid username. And I have to be honest here, there are, of course, many different types of attacks on our cryptography that we didn't cover here. But for the exam, these are the ones I think you need to know about. So I hope this has helped you get a little bit of a better understanding on some of the different types of attacks we can have against our cryptography and what we can do to protect against them. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture.
In the next couple of lectures, we're going to talk about data handling, data storage, and data retention. Data handling is an administrative control. We only want individuals that are trusted, that should have access to the data, to be able to handle it and, well, access it. We have very clear policies on who can access the data, how, when, and why they are allowed to access it, which then feeds back to our need to know. And then we should have auditing and logs in place to make sure that after the fact, we can confirm whomever accessed that data had a good reason to do so. I think in most places where I have worked with are pretty good logs, but not all the places would have that backend audit system. For the exam, remember, perfect world, so assume that we do. We have that top-down IT security governance approach that we would want in our organization. People are always more important than stuff, and we have the time and the money to do your due diligence and do your due care. So for the exam, we have that backend system that can confirm this is who accessed the data, this is when they did it. So if any red flags are raised, they would need to explain why they accessed that data. Now, how we store our data is, of course, also very critical. The attackers always look for the weakest link. If, for instance, we use backup tapes, well then, the backup tapes should be kept in a secure climate control facility that is preferably geographically distant. Because while the majority of the restores that we do are not critical, it's most likely just a user that deleted some files and the need to restore them, we're still going to have the rare ones, the ones that are actually very important, where we have a disaster. And for those, we want to make sure that the backup tapes are stored at that geographically distant location where they're not going to be affected by the same disaster we had, but it's still not going to take an excessive amount of time to get the tapes because we need to be able to restore from those tapes in a reasonable amount of time and in a reasonable manner. So far enough away without being too far away. And when we decide where that is, here we would look at our MTD, the maximum tolerable downtime. If our MTD is four hours and it's going to take us two hours, to restore the system using the backups, well then that leaves us at the most two hours to get the hardware up and running, the software installed, before we need to do the restore. So if the company that delivers the backup tape or we drive to the location, if that's going to take us four hours, well then we're past the MTD. And all of this is something that we do in our disaster recovery plan. We do the testing, then we do the walkthrough, and then we might realize the tapes are going to be there too late. Well, then we need to negotiate another deal with whomever is storing our tapes, or we might need to find another vendor. Another caveat here. It is very normal for the vendor to come out to our facility and pick the tapes up. Whomever they have to come out and pick our tapes up have to be licensed and bonded. Meaning if they, for whatever reason, lose those tapes, they are liable and they have insurance. In most of the places I have worked in, we have had a list. These are the 10 people that are allowed to come and pick up our backup tapes. We have a printout with their picture, their name, and they have to show some sort of ID before they get the tapes. If someone shows up who's not on that list, they don't get our tapes. And most places use these backup tapes because they're relatively inexpensive and you can store a ton of data on them. And when I say a ton of data, the last ones I saw in use were LTO8s. Their native capacity is about 12 terabyte and their compressed capacity is about 30 terabytes. That is a ton of data on a tape that's not very big. For the people in the US who haven't seen backup tapes before, they are about 4 by 4 inches and then maybe slightly less than an inch tall. I think it's 0 0.85. From the people outside of the US who've never seen them either, that's about 10 by 10 centimeters and then about 2 centimeters tall. So really not that big. And now for some tape horror stories. Some of them are older, some of them are not. Both the ones that I have heard about and the ones that I have experienced are of things that we shouldn't do. With some of them, people said, well, we need an off-site storage for our tapes. We don't really have the budget for it, so I'm just going to take them home with me. If something happens, we have the tapes. But the tapes were unencrypted. Someone broke into their house, and now all that confidential information was stolen. I've seen some places where they have them in storage cabinets, so employees can go in, grab a pen, some paper, some paper clips, and a couple of backup tapes with our unencrypted data. And then finally, my own example, when I was working as a project manager to relocate a large data center in Hawaii, we found more than 10,000 storage tapes under the floor of the data center. I mean, it was more secure than some of the other examples because most people wouldn't have access to that subflooring in the data center. On top of that, why would they look under the floor? But some of those tapes were tapes that we needed to restore data with. What if there had been a disaster in the data center? Well, all that would be lost because all the backups were in the same room as the actual servers. 
So yeah, horror stories, but these are actual decisions where people thought this is a good idea or at least it's a solution to a problem. Well, you and I obviously understand we need to keep our data secure at all stages on all media, and all media means all media. We can't have that weak link in our chain. Our papers need to be just as protected as the tapes. You should assume that the attackers are very good at what they do, they do a ton of research before they even attack. Now, if they learn we have pretty good defense in depth, well, then they're not going to try to attack the actual servers. That would be a waste of time. But if they find out that we keep our storage tapes downstairs next to the public restroom, well, then they really just need to get access to that restroom and then break into the room next to it where the tapes are kept. And now, after all that gloom and doom, let's look at data retention. It's very common in large organizations to have petabytes and petabytes of data. And it's just not feasible to keep all that data on our desks, especially if it's not data that we actively use all the time. If we are in finance or in healthcare or in many other areas, there are certain requirements on how long we have to keep certain data. So we use a ton of backup tapes. Let's say it's patient records. Well, then they need to be kept forever, meaning every time we do a backup, that backup gets sent to the backup facility and it's going to sit there as long as we are in business. If we go out of business, then it's a requirement that that data gets transferred to someone in the same field. Now, if we are the same hospital and we have our payroll records, let's say they have a seven-year retention, then we do a weekly full backup. We send that backup to a backup facility and then it just sits there for seven years. Unless, of course, for some reason we need it to restore with. Let's say that's never the case. We don't ever have to restore from that specific tape. Well, then after seven years, that tape is returned to us from the backup facility. And since it is seven years old, it's unlikely we're going to reuse that tape. So we need to destroy it because we need to keep our data as long as it is required by law or it is useful. And the last part, the as long as it is useful, we need to take with a grain of salt because there might be privacy laws that prevents us from keeping the data as long as we want just because we think it's useful. If we go back to the example with the payroll records, we keep them for seven years. Now we can dispose of them. There are no legal requirements for us to keep them any longer, but there might be a privacy law that says we have to destroy them now. Well, then we have to. Now, if that privacy law is not there and we want to do some analytics on our payroll data, well, then we can. We can keep it. Once that's done, we will probably destroy the tapes. In most cases, though, once the retention is over, we just get rid of the backup. And this is where you, as a good cybersecurity professional, needs to understand and know the laws and regulations that govern your country, your state, and that are specific to the line of business that your company is in. And with that, we are done with this lecture. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next one. So now we have that tape with payroll data. The seven years have expired. We don't have a use for it. We need to dispose of it. How do we do that safely and securely? If you remember back to when we talked about insider and outsider threats, 6% of all threats are things we face from lost or improper disposal. That is almost 20% of the internal threats. We do our due care and we do our due diligence. We make sure that this is not the weakest link in our chain. And remember here, Data is data. It doesn't matter if it's on an electronic medium, if it's on paper or any other format. We need to dispose of it properly. Because even if we destroy all our tapes, all our desks, we do everything right. If we just throw paper out with the same data on it, well, that's where the attacker is going to look. So if we start out with paper data, in most places I have worked, we have had thread bins. They're basically trash cans, maybe four feet tall or one meter and 20 centimeters. And they have a little slot for paper. So you can put your printouts in there and then the container has a lock on it. Every two weeks or whatever we pay for, some company comes out, picks up that paper and disposes of that paper properly. Some of them do it on site. Most of the ones I've seen do. So they come in, pick up the trash cans with all the paper in it, unlock the lock, put it through this giant shredder they have in a truck. Then they bring the containers back and then they give you a little piece of paper that says this paper was disposed of properly. And we then have that paper trail to prove that we did what we needed to. And just like with the storage tapes, we need to make sure that they are licensed and bonded to do proper paper disposal in the area that we are in. Now, if this is not something we can afford, or it's just not available where our organization is, well, then we still need to dispose of that data. Here, maybe we just buy a cross shredder. You can do the same for your home. Never ever throw anything with sensitive data in the trash. I'm gonna guess that you have seen some of the same movies that I have, 
where someone shreds their paper, but they don't cross shred, meaning it's those long strips of paper, and then they have 50 or 100 people that are sitting there, sifting through all the shredded paper, putting it back together. Or they have some sort of computer AI doing it for them, which is why I say cross shredding. So instead of having those long strips of paper, where one piece of paper is maybe turned into 50 or 60 strips, with a cross shredder, that same piece of paper is now turned into 500 or 1000 pieces. It's still doable, but it's much, much less likely that they're going to do that and they're going to succeed. Which then brings us to digital disposal. Here we have many more options on how we choose to destroy our data. We of course pick the most appropriate option for whatever we're getting rid of. And here you see the elephant, so you understand this is an important, important topic. I would also understand what the different types are, how they work, what they do, and what they do not do. If we're talking about storage tapes, well then technically we could degauss them or shred them. But if we're talking about SSD drives, then we can't degauss. Or if the media is damaged, obviously full destruction is going to get rid of everything, but it's not always financially viable. So here we might choose other things. If we start out with deletion, deletion is just you deleting the file on whatever system you're on. It really does nothing because deleting the file doesn't actually delete the file. It just removes the files from the table, but the actual data is still there. It's not gone. Now, if we still use that system, it's not going to stay there forever, but it's going to stay there until the location where the data is, is overwritten. The same with formatting. If you format a hard drive, everything is still there. It just puts a new file structure on top of the old one. And it all stays there until new data is written on top of the old data. Which then brings us to overwriting or clearing. This is done by a program that writes all zeros or all ones. Remember the binary values of all data. And it does that randomly over every single bit on the drive. In most cases, that's probably enough. But there have been cases where people have been able to retrieve data from a drive that's been overwritten. Another pitfall here can be what do you do when you have a damaged drive? You can't overwrite that. Or if the sectors are just damaged, they can still contain valid data. And if we can't overwrite them, well, then the data is still there. Some places we can also choose if the drive is still functional to encrypt the whole drive. Here the point is someone can't decrypt it. So even if they get access to that drive, it means nothing. And then we may choose other sanitation methods on that drive later. It's just another part of our layered defense. Next up, we have purging and sanitation. And they are similar but slightly different. Sanitation is where we make recovery of the data from a drive infeasible for a level given of recovery effort. And what that really means is, if the attacker puts in this level of effort, it should be infeasible for them to recover any data. But if they put in more effort, well, maybe they can. And as you can hear here, this does not prevent recovery of data, but it still might be enough if the data on the drive we're getting rid of is worth $10,000, but it's going to cost the attacker a million dollars. Well, then it makes sense, right? I don't know of any examples where it's going to cost them a million, but that's not the point. The point is it's infeasible for a certain amount of effort, making it not a viable attack vector. And then the purge is the same. We remove the sensitive data from the system or device, but this is to a point where data recovery is no longer feasible even in a laboratory environment, meaning it doesn't matter how much money they throw at it, they still can't recover the data. So for data destruction, a common type of that could be degaussing. And that's what we do with spinning disks and anything else where the data is stored magnetically. For an SSD drive, it will really do nothing. And it's just a giant electromagnetic field that makes changes in the magnetic charges on the drive. You've seen the movie, right? The hacker is compromised. They have to destroy the proof. They take the hard drive out and they put it in the microwave. This is the same, just much, much stronger. And remember here, all of this is data destruction. This will most likely also render the drive unusable. Now, if we're planning to use this drive again, well then really, overriding is the only option. Which then brings us to full physical destruction. And that can either be shredders, similar to the paper shredders, but instead here, the giant machines, because they have to shred a hard drive that's mostly made out of metal. They can also be disc crushers. Here, they just crush the disc, they don't shred it, and crushers can be much cheaper and much smaller. You put a disc in, and the crusher pushes multiple metal pins through the disc, breaking it up and crushing it. And most of the pieces come out in maybe an inch or two. That's two and a half to five centimeters. In most cases, that's probably fine. But if this is sensitive data, we want to use a shredder. Whereas a disc crusher can be reasonably inexpensive for a company, maybe five to ten thousand dollars, a disc shredder is probably closer to forty-five to fifty thousand. 
I think the last one I was involved in buying was around 40,000. For some organizations, that's nothing. For others, it might be a lot. And we could also be fortunate enough to be in an area where there is a company that does exactly the same like they did with the paper shredding, they do it for the disks. They show up, they pick up our disks, they give us a receipt, and then they certify that all these hard drives with all these serial numbers, all these storage tapes have been completely destroyed, and we have that receipt with all those inventory items and serial numbers proving we did what we should, we are in compliance. We could technically also use incineration, pulverization, melting, or acid. I have personally never heard of anywhere where they actually did that, but I mean, the more you destroy something, the more certain you are that you have that proper data destruction. And in most places, we would do multiple types. So at the bank where I worked, we had full disk encryption, meaning even if the attacker got the disk, they couldn't decrypt it. Then we would decost the disk, and then once that was done, then we would crush it. At one of the hospitals where I worked, we didn't have a degausser, but again here, everything was fully encrypted, and then we had the disk shredder. For 95 plus percent of our digital disposal, that might be overkill. But it is much, much cheaper to do it this way, spend the little extra money, than it is to lose data that's worth a million or 10 million, because we didn't do proper disposal. And yes, I have been the person who got handed 400 hard drives, where I then had to degauss them one by one, and then crush them one by one. That's a couple of days of work right there. Now, if we had had a real shredder, that would have taken maybe an hour or two. And with that, we are done with this lecture. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next one. All right, let's recap. In this lecture, we talked about data handling, data storage, and data retention. Data handling is an administrative control, meaning we only want the individuals who should have access to the data also to handle it. We have those very clear policies on who can access the data, why, when, where, how. And this is with need to know. You have to have a need to know to access the data. We then have the auditing and the locks in place. So after the fact, we can make sure you had a good need to know. In the perfect world, we have some sort of backend IT audit system that does that for us. When we talk about backup tapes, they should be kept at a secure, climate controlled, and preferably somewhat geographically distant location. We want it close enough for when we need to restore, it doesn't take a lot of time to get the tapes, but we also want it far enough away that if we have a disaster, they're not affected by the same disaster. Now, how far away that is really depends on our MTD, our maximum tolerable downtime. If our MTD is four hours and it's going to take us four hours to get the tapes, well, then we can't restore in time. For most of our backups, we use storage tapes. They are relatively inexpensive, they can hold a ton of data, and they're easy to store. The LTO tapes are what we mostly use. The latest version I worked with, I think, was LTO 8s. One of those can have 12 terabyte of data, and if we compress it, we're up to 30 terabyte. That is a ton of data for a small tape that is no more than 4 by 4 inches or 10 by 10 centimeters. We, of course, need to have that proper storage of the tapes. That means that they are not stored under someone's bed at their house. They're not just in some random closet wherever we have space, and they're definitely not under the floor in the data center like the example I had from Hawaii. Because what if something happened to that data center? Then both all the servers, all the data, and the backups that we need to restore that data with, they're all in the data center. If that's destroyed, well, then everything is gone. And when we talk about protecting data, that's data in any form. It's not just the backup tapes or the disks. It's in paper, it's in audio. So with much of the data we have, it's going to have certain retention requirements. That means how long do we need to keep that data for? Some of the examples that I have used from healthcare or from banking, we could have seven years. For seven years, we have to keep this data. And since it would not be feasible to do that on disk, whenever we do a full backup of, let's say, payroll records, then we keep that for seven years. And since we do that backup every week, we're going to have 52 tapes for every year times seven, just for that one system. We send that tape off to the facility, and in most cases, that tape just sits there for seven years. After the seven years have passed, we get the tape back. At that point, the tape is too old. We can't really reuse it because it's all technology. So we destroy it. Now, the more we destroy it, the less chance we have of data being recovered. But that's also going to be more expensive. So we choose the right type of disposal. But if you remember back to when we talked about threats, 6% of all threats are from lost or improper disposal. Out of our internal threats, that is almost 20%.
So for paper records, if there's potential for anything incriminating, anything sensitive, they need to be destroyed, and that should be cross-threaded, not just single thread. We can either do it ourselves, or we can pay someone to do it. With digital media, we can do the same, right? We can thread the drives, we can crush them, we can technically pour acid on them or something weird like that. But in most cases, it's going to be overriding all the data with ones and zeros. That obviously assumes that we can write to all the sectors. Then we can do a full encryption of the drive. While that doesn't delete anything, it makes it less likely for the attacker to break the encryption. We can degauss the spinning disks or really anything where the data is stored magnetically. And that was the one that was just a giant electromagnetic field that makes changes in the magnetic charges on the drives. Think of it like the hacker throwing the hard drive in the microwave, just much stronger. And of course here, we have the proper destruction for whatever we're protecting. If there's no sensitive data on that drive, maybe we just do a full disk encryption and degauss it or crush it or something else. If this is top secret, well, maybe here we do the purge, then we do the degaussing, and then we use the shredder. Most of those by themselves should be enough, but having them all combined would make it probably impossible to retrieve that data again. And with that, we are done for this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little bit of a better understanding of data handling, data storage, and data retention, and what we do to get rid of the data and the media it's stored on once it's no longer usable. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about directive or administrative controls. And we have talked about these before. That is our policies, our procedures, but this is also our training and education. In our control categories, we also have technical and physical controls. And they really are a critical part because we need all three. We have the directive or administrative controls, and using those, we then design our technical and physical controls. In the directive controls, we outline how something needs to be protected, and then using the physical and technical controls, we make that happen. Now that we have refreshed the control categories, let's do a quick recap on the different access control types. And many of the things that we implement can be multiple of these. So a single control can both be preventative and detective, but it doesn't have to be. And most of these control types are not necessarily something we can tie back and say this is an administrative or directive control. Directive controls, some of the things they do can be preventative. But really, we have the directive controls so we can put in the right technical and logical controls. So preventative controls prevent something from happening. Detective alerts us during or after an attack. Corrective corrects a problem. Recovery controls help us recover after an attack. A deterrent control deters an attack. And then the compensating controls are the ones we put in place where none of the others are feasible. So with that compensating control, we get the right security posture that we need, 
even though we can't implement the controls we would want to. Maybe a very complex access control system like we want would be $10 million. Since it's that expensive, it might be prohibitive. But what if we just hire guards and have them check the IDs of all employees? Then we might not need that system. The guards are then partially a compensating control. They're also going to be deterrent. Because people see the guard, they might be deterred from trying to get into our facility. They can also be preventative. They can be detective. And guards are one of the ones where it can fit in so many categories depending on what they do. So now that we're clear on that, let's move on to the policies. And remember, they are mandatory and they're high level. And we built those policies from all the things above in the pyramid. So we have our values, we have our vision, we have our business objectives. From that, we built the IT strategy. Using that, we built the IT security strategy. And then using that, we built the IT security policies. With our policies, they also have somewhat of an iterative life cycle. First, we develop them, we maintain them, then we have an approval process for them, and then we have exceptions. And for our policies, we really also need to update them on a regular basis. If they're based on compliance, they should be updated at least every year, just to make sure that we are still in compliance with whatever law or regulation this policy is focused on. And then, of course, we do auto-cycle updates if we know the law or regulation is changing. In our policies, which are based on our strategy, we want to make sure that those policies capture the expectation, the direction of Sheena management, and their intent with all of the above. The vision, the mission, the objectives, the strategy. Policies should be written in plain language, something that's short, something that's easy to understand. If we write over complex policies, we shouldn't expect people to be able to follow them. And of course, we need everything in the pyramid above the policy before we make the policy. The policy is based on all of the above, where in many places they have a tendency to make the security policies before they make the security strategy. That makes no sense. And within IT and cybersecurity, we will have a ton of different policies. We can have policies on application security. It could be on how we classify our data. It can be on patch management. How we raise the security awareness with our employees through our training. I don't think for the exam that you need to know all the different types of policies that we have in IT and cybersecurity, but just know that there are a ton of them and we have some that are specific only to IT and cybersecurity and we have some that are for the general public. Everybody in the company needs to adhere to these policies. So first off, we have an acceptable use policy that basically just outlines for our employees what is the acceptable use of our network, our data, our resources, and this is something that they sign before they gain access to our network. So as part of their onboarding, they say, yes, I understand, this is acceptable, and this is unacceptable. And remember here, we had the three different types of policies. We have regulatory, those are based on laws and regulations, and we have those so we are in compliance with those regulations and laws. Then we have advisory policies. Those are the ones that outline what type of behavior is acceptable and what is not. And then we have informational policies. Those are just there to give people certain information. That could be this is why we have this mission statement. This is our vision. Our employees don't have to do anything to comply with those. It's just to inform them. The advisory and the regulatory policies we have to follow. So the acceptable use policy is an advisory policy. They have to follow it. The same with bring your own device policy. And bring your own device is exactly what it sounds like. We allow employees to bring their own devices and use them in a work setting within certain parameters. And this is part of what we talked about when we talked about the Internet of Things. If we have an IoT VLAN, we can either add the BYOD devices to that, but even better, we should give them their own VLAN. And I have worked in places where the company offered full support for every single device, regardless of how obscure. And I have worked in places where they may get access to the email server, maybe the internet, but not actually any critical data. Regardless of how we choose to implement, we of course need to make sure that this doesn't weaken our security posture. Again here, easier, more convenient, very, very rarely means more secure. It almost always means less. Then we have a privacy policy that outlines how we gather, use, disclose, and manage private data. And that can both be for our customers, but it can also be for our internal employees. And since we are living in a time where there's a lot of emphasis on privacy in most large organizations, we will publish our privacy policy on our website or somewhere else externally facing. With most of our other policies, we probably just have them internally. And since our customers can see that privacy policy, they also know what to expect if they do business with us. We also would have a password policy, and that would outline all the specifics about how we make sure that passwords are secure. And these are just random examples. 
Maybe we will remember the last 24 passwords. That way Bob can just cycle through his passwords to get the password he wants. We have an expiration date of passwords of 90 days. So every 90 days, you have to change your password. Then we have a minimum age of 2 days. This again is to prevent Bob from changing his password 25 times so he gets his favorite password. Then we have a minimum character length of 8 characters, but that could just as well be 12 or 16 or 20. Then we have a requirement for the passwords to be complex. That is the uppercase, the lowercase, the numbers, the symbols. And then passwords should not be stored using reversible encryption. Now, if you think back to when we talked about encryption, reversible encryption would be symmetric or asymmetric. Non-reversible encryption would be hashes. So we store the hashed value of the password, but we don't store the password itself. Then when the user types in their password, we hash whatever they type in. If the two hashes match, they have entered the right password. And then you can see my comment dot dot dot, meaning there are so many different policies that we have to adhere to in all the different areas of work that we do. If it is our data handling policy that basically outlines how we handle data, well, then it's going to have parts where it shows how do we classify our data? How do we categorize it? How do we label it? What is appropriate storage? How should it be encrypted? What type of backup rotation should we have? How long is that retention? And finally, when the data is no longer usual, how do we dispose of that data? How do we destroy it? With that data handling policy, we need to be aware of the three different states of data. Because how we protect the data in each state is completely unique. So data at rest, that is stored data. That can be on our disks, our tapes, that can be CDs or DVDs, it's USB sticks. But it is data that is not actively being used and it is not being transported. Where here, in most cases, the answer is encryption. We want to encrypt almost any data that's not being used. Then we have data in motion, and that's data being transferred from one point to another, from the source to the destination. Here, we again want encryption, but different types of encryption. We want end-to-end -end encryption, meaning if I'm sending you a file, it gets encrypted on my PC, and it gets sent to your PC, encrypted the entire way. It's not until it gets to layer 6 on your PC that it gets decrypted. Meaning even if someone intercepted that traffic, they can't see what we're talking about. And then finally, data in use. We are actively using the files or the data. Since we're actively using it, we cannot encrypt it. But here, we can use good practices and we can have policies to support those. So we can have a clean desk policy. That's the one way you're not allowed to have papers that have sensitive data on your desk unless you're actively using it and you are at your desk. If you leave the desk, you lock them away. Or if you're done using the data, you shred them. We could also have a print policy. If our printers print automatically, whenever you hit print, you have to go to the printer as soon as you hit that button. In most places though, we would want to have some sort of ID card swipe. So you send it to the print server, you go up to the printer, you swipe your card, and your things print out. I cannot tell you how many audits that I have seen issues with where people print sensitive data and then forget about it. When the auditors come in, that's one of the first places they check. We can also have a policy that says no shoulder surfing, meaning you're not allowed to stand behind someone when they work where you can see their screen. And like I mentioned, there are 50 other policies that we could have in place, but for the exam, I think these are the ones you need to know. All right, let's recap. We talked about administrative or directive controls. Those are policies and our procedures. Many people don't think they are as important as the technical or physical controls. I think they're maybe even more important because we use them to design the technical and physical controls. We talked a little bit about the different control types. Preventative, it prevents something from happening. Detective, we detect something during or after an attack. Corrective, it corrects something. Recovery, helps us recover after an attack. Deterrent, it deters an attack, it doesn't stop it, but it makes it less likely to happen. And then finally, compensating controls. Those are the controls we implement when none of the other controls are feasible. They are either physically impossible, they're too expensive, it's just something we can't or won't do. Then we implement compensating controls to get the security posture that we need. Then we talked about our policies, how they are mandatory and they are high level, and they're built on all of the stuff on top of the policies in Orange here in this pyramid. So we have our mission, we have our vision, we have our values. Using that, we build our objectives. Using those, we build our IT strategy. Using those, we build our IT and cybersecurity strategy. And using that, we build our security policies. We have to have all the stuff above before we do the security policies. We can't just implement security policies if we don't have a strategy. And then we talked a little bit about some specific policies, the acceptable use policy, what is acceptable use of our network, the data, and our resources, 
This is a piece of paper that employees sign before they gain access to anything. Then we talked about BYOD, where employees can bring their own devices in. We segment that network off. We give it probably somewhat limited access. And then depending on our organization, we may or may not support their devices. If they want to bring their own stuff in, the support is on themselves. We touched on privacy policies, which is how we gather, use, disclose, and manage private data. And that is both for internal employees and it is for our customers. We may have separate policies for the two. Then we talked about password policies. That could be saying that the password management system remembers the last 24 passwords. We have to change our passwords every 90 days. A password has to be at least two days old before we can change it. It has to have a certain amount of characters. It has to have complex passwords, meaning the uppercase, lowercase, number, and symbol. And then we store passwords in a non-reversible encryption form. That is hashing. Remember, it's a one-way function, variable length plain text, fixed length output. And then we talked about how we can have a data handling policy, how we classify, how we categorize, label, store, encrypt, backup, and destroy our data. And then finally, we talked about the three different states of data, because the different states of data needs different protection. Data at rest, that is stored data, that is tape drives, disk, but it's not actively being used. Here, we use encryption. Data in motion, it's being transferred over a network. If I'm sending you a file, we want end-to-end -end encryption, meaning it gets encrypted on my device, it gets decrypted on yours. Anywhere where that data traverses a network, even if the attacker was able to get that traffic, they can't decrypt it. And then finally, we have data in use. It's actively being used, we can encrypt. So here we have our policies, we have outlines for what is acceptable. So we have the clean desk policy, we have the print policy, we have the no shoulder serving policy. And then with those policies in place, we raise the security level of data in use to an acceptable level. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little bit of a better understanding of our administrative or directive controls, how and why we use them, and then some of the specific types that we covered. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to talk about training and awareness. And I know most companies say that their greatest asset is their users, but on the other hand of that, they are also the largest security threat. And some of that is malicious, but most of it is because we haven't given them the right training, we haven't raised their awareness, which then changes their behavior. And much of this ties back to what we've talked about already. We have the clean desk policy. Having the policy does nothing. If we haven't given our employees the training, we haven't raised their awareness, they haven't changed their behavior. And we could, of course, punish people for not doing what they're supposed to. But it is a much better strategy to reward them for doing what they're supposed to. If they are not doing it, it's a failure on our part because we haven't given them the right training. And I cannot tell you how many security training events I have sat through that were just horrible. It's just some person mumbling through some PowerPoint slides who may or may not even understand what they talk about. When that is the kind of training we give our employees, we cannot expect them to change their behavior. And training and awareness is an administrative or directive control. And we have our IT and cybersecurity training for multiple reasons. First off, it might be required by laws or regulations. And that's mostly why we have the training that doesn't change anything. Those are the boring PowerPoint slides. We're just doing it because we have to check a box. Yes, we gave them the training this year, but we really don't care about the result. As you can hear, that's obviously not what we want. We want to give them as efficient and as effective training as possible. And of course, for that, we need senior management's buy-in. Because if they are completely on board with the training, they're going to give us the time and the resources that we need, but they're also going to help us get all the managers, all the directors in line, who will then make sure that their team is on board. And then for the training, it needs to be varied. I know sitting through what we do in a fire drill is not super exciting, but some of it we can make more exciting. We, of course, need that more engaging training, but we can also use gamification. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, it's just turning training, something that may be boring, into a game. You've probably seen it on websites or on forums. If you post this many posts, you get a golden tag. If you're active every day, you get a certain badge. So whatever website or forum, they reward you for being engaged and actively participating 
and it just works very well. People like being rewarded, and it really doesn't matter that the rewards are completely meaningless. To them, they're not. This could be something as simple as saying in the beginning of the training, if you're able to answer these questions at the end, there's going to be a reward for you or for your team. In many places, I've also seen ongoing competitions because people are going to learn and they're going to change their behavior much, much easier if there's something fun or there's some sort of reward. Let's say we do a security training session and this specific one is on fishing and then whomever can answer the right questions at the end, maybe that team gets free pizza. But then two weeks later, we send a phishing email out to the entire organization. And then the team with the highest percentage of team members that report that as a phishing email to security, they get rewarded somehow. That could be half a day off or the company could pay for them to go bowling. Or it could just be a post on the intranet where they get praised. People like that sort of recognition. They like when we show, hey, these guys did good. We can also use security champions. That is someone from each team who's responsible for raising the awareness within their team and thereby changing the team behavior. Again here, they can get some sort of reward, but people also just like the title, security champion. And then we need some sort of metric to show that this team is now more aware of security. They have changed their behavior, so it needs to be something we can track. And when they do that, then we reward the security champion and their team. In the places where I have worked, whenever we have done this, if we do the training for the phishing email or really any other training, we went from getting maybe one or two emails a day with some sort of security incident saying, is this a phishing email? Or this door doesn't close all the way when we exit. After the training is done, after we have the champions, after we have raised their awareness, maybe we get 40 or 50 emails. And yes, more emails is good because that doesn't mean we have more security risks. That means that our teams are aware and they report the incidences so we can fix them. And then over time, that number is going to taper down, meaning it's going to get less and less. First off, because we fixed many of the things that were broken. But secondly, also because they need to be reminded, they need to be retrained every so often. So in places where I have worked, we have had a security focus on something specific every month or two. This month is phishing awareness. Next month is physical security awareness and so on. Once we have trained them all, we have given them that knowledge, we have raised their awareness, we have changed their behavior, then to them it becomes second nature. And that's going to give us that cybersecurity culture we want where we have good cyber hygiene. And then over time, we refresh that knowledge. We keep them engaged, we keep them interested, we keep rewarding them. It's both much, much safer. It's also much, much cheaper. If we give our employees the right training, we raise their awareness, then it is just to have a single security incident because we didn't. And for some of them, it's enough we say, we have to change this, this is what you need to do. Others need to understand why. I am one of those people. I'm not just going to accept what you say unless you can articulate why. So for those people, we find somewhere to explain at their level, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is what it's going to get us if we do, this is what it's going to get us if we don't, just like we did with change management. So here, it's the multiple complementary overlapping reinforcements. We give them the right training. We reward them when they do what they're supposed to do. We have someone in the team that's the security champion that advocates for security and helps their team understand it. And then we reward them some more. All right, let's recap. We talked about how we give the users the right training so we can raise their awareness so we can change their behavior. For that, we need both the completely right training. It needs to be not boring. There needs to be some sort of engagement and we can use gamification. That's where we turn it into a game. There are some sort of rewards if they do well. That can be during or after the training event. Whomever can answer the questions right gets some sort of reward. And then a couple of weeks later, if this was on phishing, we can send a phishing email out. The team or the top teams where the highest percentage of their team members reported that phishing email to security, they get some sort of reward. Most places think that their employees are the biggest asset, which I think is excellent, but it is also the biggest risk. So we need to give them that right training. And it really does work with gamification. Our employees are our first layer of defense. And if we do it right, we can build that good cybersecurity culture where we have proper cyber hygiene. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little bit of a better understanding of how and why we need to train our employees so we raise their awareness so they change their behavior. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture.